Hello and welcome everyone to the first ever keynote address for the first ever Ask Historians Digital Conference. And I just want to start by saying it's absolutely surreal to be here today as part of an event that barely could have been imagined about six months ago. And over the course of the day, I'm still having to pinch myself occasionally to be sure that it is actually happening, which is, I suppose, a side effect of not being there in person. Here is the chair of the conference organizing committee. And my role today really is just to introduce our speaker as well as moderate the Q&A that will come after his talk. But before I do that, I do want to just say quickly on behalf of the conference team, thank you very much for coming along today. We're delighted to see such a strong turnout for what promises to be a very special event. We very much hope that you enjoy today's keynotes as well as the rest of what the conference is going to offer over the next few days. And with that, with that said, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Professor Alex Wellerstein. He's an acclaimed historian of science and technology with particular expertise in the history of nuclear weapons. He's the author of numerous scholarly works, including the forthcoming Restricted Data, The History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States, which will be published early next year by the University of Chicago Press. Professor Wellerstein is also the current Director of Science and Technology Studies at the Stevens Institute for Technology in New Jersey. And his expertise has made him sought after in newsrooms from CNN to C-SPAN, while his writing is featured in outlets like the Washington Post, New Yorker, and the Atlantic. We're, of course, delighted he's agreed to share all this expertise with us today. But beyond his particular standing as a scholar, I think it's appropriate that Professor Wellerstein will be giving a keynote for this particular conference. Alongside his academic credentials, Professor Wellerstein has been a pioneer in digital public history practice. His long-running and highly popular research blog, is world famous for achieving a fine balance between depth and accessibility. And if there are any students who happen to be listening, it's perhaps one of the only blogs in existence that you can get away with citing in a history essay. And to give you an idea of just how far his work is spread, his NukeMap online nuclear weapons simulator has been used a staggering 30 million times since it was created. And of course, those of us who are regular readers of Ask Historians undoubtedly already know He's one of our most long-standing and prolific contributors to our forums, writing on nuclear history under the username of U-Restricted Data since 2012. And I, for one, find it's incredibly fitting that a conference which is really all about reimagining what digital public history can look like should have a keynote speaker whose entire career is testimony to what can be achieved by innovation in this field. And on that note, I'd like to hand over now to Professor Wellerstein, who will be speaking today on the atomic bomb and visions of the new post-war order. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to hear that, all that very nice introduction. And I'm really pleased you're here to watch me beam to you digitally wherever you are. I'm going to share my screen for the presentation for a moment. You may see a picture of my dog, just warning you. All right, there he is, Mr. Peppers. Hey, welcome. I'm truly honored uh, to, be at, to have been asked to give this keynote talk for Ask Historians' first digital conference. Um, as Fraser was saying, I've frequented Ask Historians perhaps too much over the last eight years, if you can believe it, and use it as a way to disseminate historical knowledge. Uh, I like to use it as a way to keep a finger on the pulse of what kind of questions regular people like to ask about history. Um, and let's be honest, I use it as a form of uh, semi-productive procrastination at times. It's For me, it's a relaxing thing to go online and argue with people about the atomic bomb, but that's, you know, that's my problem. I've been consistently impressed by the quality of the moderation at Ask Historians uh, and the fact that it's about as pleasant an online community you can find for serious historical discussion. And I do not I'm not meaning that in any kind of sarcasm. I've been involved in a lot of online communities, including ones run by academics, and uh, usually they are not really that pleasant. Ask Historians is a joy to participate in. I've managed to learn a lot from reading other people's responses on there as well. So thank you again, and thank you for asking me to give this talk. I think Ask Historians is, is an impressive model for what a form of digital history and digital sort of interaction can look like. The theme of this conference is business as unusual. And I think that's an apt descriptor for our current state of affairs. Other pithy descriptions that come to mind for our present you know, condition are uh, interesting times or perhaps the great dumpster fire. Uh, living through this present historical moment gives us all, I think, some empathy for people who lived in troubled times in the past, periods that historians later have given pithy names like the Warring States period or the Troubles or one of my favorites, the Age of Extremes. For our present moment, uh, you know, I don't think we know exactly what it should be called. There's a number of 
you know, hypotheticals out there, the great unraveling, uh, one of my favorites uh, from William Gibson, the jackpot, and uh, or maybe more ominously, the new normal. It's too early to know what we're going to call, what historians of the future will call our moment, because we don't really know where it's going yet. Um, but I think people are aware that we live in a very complex time whose complexity seems to be increasing, not necessarily uh, to a necessarily positive end. In our present moment, we can try to imagine the future, but frequently we do so either through references to the past and finding the relevant past to reference is no simple matter, or through the realm of fiction, which itself is a sort of imaginative explication of our present historical context. The people writing fiction are in our world, even if they're trying to imagine getting outside of it. When confronted with something that seem, might seem genuinely novel, we are necessarily limited in our ability to guess the future and somewhat constrained by the expectations conditioned into us by our past and present. For this talk, I want to talk about another time period, some time behind us, about 75 years ago. This year is the 75th anniversary of the creation and use of the first atomic bombs. This was a technology developed from one surprising scientific discovery that many people who were involved in its creation thought would engineer and result in an entirely new future. For this talk, I want to talk a bit about how people who made the bomb thought about this invention that they were making, what they tried to do about the long-term horizons they imagined, and what ended up being the results of these efforts. So let's do a brief overview of the salient events leading up to the development of first nuclear weapons, just so everybody's on the, uh, the same page. And this image in the background, by the way, is one of my favorites of the atomic bomb period. This is the first, uh, the, the very first light of the Trinity test explosion. The black spots are where the heat has burned through the emulsion of the film. It's the sort of earliest moment of the age of nuclear weapons. So, in late 1939, late, late 1938, scientists based out of a laboratory in Berlin and elsewhere discovered a new scientific phenomenon, nuclear fission, the, the splitting of very heavy atoms uh, like uranium. Uh, within a few months, scientists in many countries had confirmed the, that this discovery offered up the possibility of building weapons of fantastic power. And within a year or so, you have scientists in a number of big countries, including the United States and Germany, the Soviet Union, Japan, uh, United Kingdom, basically writing to their governments and saying, this is something we ought to pay attention to. This is something that we ought to uh, invest time perhaps worrying about. Only one nation in the end ended up pursuing a full-scale nuclear weapons production program, and that's the United States, based on encouragement from the United Kingdom. And so by late 1942, they had started the top secret Manhattan Project. Uh, this was the immense wartime effort, and I, my picture in the lower left there is one of the many factories used to produce the atomic bomb, and it's, at the time it was the largest factory under one roof in the entire world. Uh, and ultimately, by using the labor of hundreds of thousands of Americans, thousands of scientists and technicians, uh, by mid-1945, the United States had built uh, actual nuclear weapons, uh, several of them. It was a colossal endeavor with a very high chance of failure. Uh, but by the spring of 1945, so I want to back up a little bit from them actually finishing the bomb, um, they were pretty aware that they were going to have this weapon. And that's when a lot of people started thinking very seriously about what was going to happen next. There's the bomb I ended up with. The spring of 1945 for me is one of the most interesting historical periods for thinking about the atomic bomb because the creation of the bomb suddenly became very real to people. Uh, they had thought about it, of course, what they were doing. They knew they were planning to make an atomic bomb, but now they had a real concrete schedule. They knew exactly when they were going to have this and uh, when they were going to probably start being able to use it. And so they started getting very, very concrete and very serious about what exactly was going to come next. But the number of people involved in these discussions was very small because the bomb project was very secret. Um, even though it had hundreds of thousands of people working on it, um, it was compartmentalized. So most people didn't know very much about the whole thing. And the number of people who were involved in policy discussions, even questions about how it would be used, was extremely small. We're talking about a dozen or so. And this could include some scientists, some military officials, and a few government figures, though surprisingly few in retrospect. Some of the people involved clearly saw the bomb as simply another military weapon. Interestingly, this is often people who were very uh, close to the actual putting it together, the, the more junior scientists, for example. They saw it in terms of the technology they interacted with with their bare hands, which was another bomb that you have to drop out of another airplane. But 
Others, especially those a bit further up in this sort of hierarchy, they started taking a more almost civilizational view of the bomb, uh, one that saw its creation as a sort of historic peril and a historic opportunity. Henry Stimson, the fellow in the picture here, uh, was the Secretary of War at the time and was the highest ranking member of both the Roosevelt and Truman cabinets to take an active role in the development of the atomic bomb. And he's a really fascinating figure in general, um, but uh, his background is really somewhat unusual for the others in the cabinet. Um, at 77, he was the oldest member of the cabinet, and he had a long history of bipartisan government service. He had been the Secretary of State, he had been the Governor General of the Philippines, he had done all sorts of things for many different presidents of many different political backgrounds. And he was sort of a kind of person, and perhaps in the time of his life, that he was really thinking about what this new discovery portended, what implications it had for uh, the, the far future. And uh, Truman, as you may know, did not know about the atomic bomb until he became president. And Stimson was the one who went up to him maybe minutes after Truman's uh, you know, official reading of the oath and told him they had a new project that he had to uh, eventually set a time to really tell him about and that it was a big deal. And a few weeks later in April of 1945, um, he had a formal sit down with the president in which he briefed him on what was done on the project, what, had, what they had built, what the schedule was for having nuclear weapons, that sort of thing. But uh, Stimson's particular push was about the long-term questions. And so he kept a note of what he said to the president at the time. And, and I think it's just worth quoting a few bits of it because it's, it's very evocative of how he thought about this. Uh, within four months, this is how he starts it, we shall in all probability have completed the most terrible weapon ever known in human history, one bomb of which could destroy a whole city. And he further explained that the, though the Americans currently had a monopoly on uh, nuclear weapons production, that wasn't going to last. Uh, because the secrets of the bomb were secrets of nature at their sort of base level, they were scientific secrets, any nation with sufficiently advanced industry and science could develop them. And they were well aware that uh, that was a possibility, and especially that Russia would probably be the next country to do so. And uh, this, he, he thought, put the bomb project into a pretty difficult light because it wasn't going to be just about using it against Japan like they were planning to do. Uh, this was now going to set the world on a new path going forward. As he put it, the world in its present state of moral advancement compared with its technical development would eventually be at the mercy of such a weapon. If these weapons are produced by many people and the world is the one that we currently live in, in which people are petty and states are warring with each other and violence is still an answer to a lot of questions, uh, that is going to lead to a lot of nuclear weapons going off. In other words, as he says, modern civilization might be completely destroyed. Now, this is this is quite a memo to go to the president, new president with, say, hey, we built a weapon and if we don't do things right, modern civilization will be destroyed. Uh, that's a pretty heavy judgment from somebody who's been in charge of making said weapon. He's not an outsider. He's not somebody saying, don't make it, don't use it. He's saying, we're going to do this, but we got to think about it. Uh, but just as Stimson warned that this weapon was unprecedented and perilous and that no state of affairs had prepared the world for its emergence, uh, he also argued that it was an opportunity. If the problem of proper use of this weapon can be solved, he wrote, we would have the opportunity to bring the world into a pattern in which the peace of the world and our civilization can be saved. And that's the rub in the end for Stimson and many of the others. The bomb represented both the worst possible invention, the thing that could threaten civilization itself, but also the best possible invention, the thing that might save civilization forever and propel us to some new post-fighting existence where we could actually start living up to the full potential. And the question was, how do you make one path work over the other? Stimson is all over the place in this early history. And he's one of my favorite figures for this reason. And I just want to point out one other, other instance of his thinking that I think is particularly vivid. Uh, a month after he met with Truman, and Truman was basically said, fine, fine, that sounds great. He didn't get involved in details. No policy came out of that meeting. He was essentially being briefed on this just to learn about it. But a month later, Stimson had a meeting uh, of a new committee called the Interim Committee, which uh, was meant to was charged with figuring out all of the problems 
of what they call the interim period, which is to say, when, after you use the bomb, but before whatever kind of new post-war order was going to emerge, um, which is a pretty big job because this not only involves how you use the bomb, they were the committee that concluded they should be using it against Japan without any warning, and that the goal would be to, as they put it, seek to make as profound a psychological impression on as many of the inhabitants as possible by using it against the city, but also it was going to include uh, what was happening after it was used. The very propaganda that might be released immediately thereafter under in the president's name, uh, the news stories that would be in every newspaper about the atomic bomb, they all sort of originated with this committee. And then they would also draft the laws and recommendations for what kind of post-war policy, post-war organizations, both domestic, which is to say American policies, but also international ways of handling this, that ought to be put into place with the goal of getting the United States on a safe path and the world in general, not just the United States. And Stimson opened the meeting with this great statement, and he, he apparently was co-signed in the sentiment by the Army Chief of Staff, General George C. Marshall, that this project should not be considered simply in terms of military weapons, but as a new relationship of man to the universe. This discovery, he went on, might be compared to the discoveries of the Copernican theory and the laws of gravity, but far more important than these and its effect on the lives of men. While the advances in the field to date have been fostered by the needs of war, it was important to realize that the implications of the project went far beyond the needs of the present war, far beyond World War II. It must be controlled, atomic energy must be controlled if possible to make it an assurance of future peace rather than a menace to civilization. And again, we see this juxtaposition. The bomb is one of two extremes, extreme salvation, extreme destruction, no middle ground whatsoever. And I think this is just a, a thing worth dwelling on that this is a, a frequent temptation of uncertain and even fearful times, a sort of polarizing limit of the imagination. And, and I think we can kind of relate to this in our moment. We see things as either heading towards full recovery back to normal, or we see things as veering very far off of you know, the rails when, you know, both of these represent extreme possibilities. There's no room for a in between. I find Stimson particularly eloquent on this topic and his relationship to political power makes him particularly important, but he wasn't the only one to see things in such terms. The scientists and engineers who were involved in the project are of particular interest in this regard, one of which uh, Niels Bohr, is a, the Danish quantum physicist of great renown, uh, was brought into the project in late 1943, and he immediately marveled at its size and, amb and ambition. Uh, but he also marveled at, at its potential. For Bohr, the existential problem was one of avoiding arms races. To accomplish this, in Bohr's mind, what you had to do was have all of the scientists of the world essentially become sort of a collective class. and be in charge of crossing borders and asking questions and sharing information with total openness and that that way the scientists would effectively tell you whether anybody was secretly making nuclear weapons and through using these sort of scientific cadres and sort of free open borders and open doors to scientists these sort of special people would be able to secure the fate of the world um, this is a sort of a gauzy and idealistic idea, but I think it's pretty interesting that this is the kind of thing people were thinking about, and it had quite an influence on many other scientists. There's another strain of thought in this uh, direction uh, uh, by two more sort of, I don't want to say practical people, but they're a little more practical than, than Bohr was, uh, Vannevar Bush and James Conan. Bush was an electrical engineer and the former vice president of MIT and the head of the wartime Office of Scientific Research and Development, which was charged with coordinating all defense research in the United States, including the Manhattan Project. Conan was a chemist and his friend and also the president of Harvard. So he's a pretty well-connected science policy kind of guy as well. And they both sort of communicated with each other throughout the war on high-level questions, especially those about the atomic bomb. And the way in which Bush thought about this, I think, is also pretty stark. And he didn't just tell others. He was part of what got Stimson to think in these terms as well. He, he and Conant lobbied Stimson to realize that the secret of the bomb could not be kept and things like that. But he even lobbied the president. He, he several times went to Truman and urged him to think in these long-term ways. And the way Bush put it to Truman in 1945 was that two paths were available. Down one path lies a secret arms race on atomic energy, down the other international collaboration and possibly ultimate control. And control here is the watchword. This is what everybody is looking for is a way to take the chaos out of the possibility of nuclear weapons. Both paths are thorny, he continued, but we live in a new world and we have to choose.
these are people not just fearing that other countries will get nuclear weapons. Both Bush and Conant were explicitly aware that the weapons they were developing during World War II were only the first generation. And already by the time in which they are having these meetings and thinking about this, they are well aware of the possibility of the hydrogen bomb. They are well aware that it is not at all impossible to imagine weapons that would be measured in the millions of tons of TNT equivalent, not just the thousands of tons that were available during World War II. They were already contemplating weapons in the 10 to 100 megatons, which they had already some scientific reason to believe that if you use these on a large scale, you could potentially render the earth too radioactive to live on. So these are not just sort of idle policy questions. These are, again, civilizational questions, questions about the direction of mankind. Bohr's plans, Bohr himself didn't really have influence on policymakers. He met with actually Roosevelt and Churchill to express his concerns, but both of them basically tried to hustle him out of their offices as fast as possible because Bohr is not a, was not a very eloquent speaker. And uh, most of the time they were trying to figure out how much he knew and who he had told it to. But Bush and Conant had some influence on Stimson and through there sort of paved the road to actual serious policy. But there were other scientists immediately after the bomb was used who pushed this on a larger scale. This is sometimes called the scientist movement. And it was in favor of Oh, as they called it, the international control of atomic energy. The idea that uh, there needed to be some kind of unification for peace or the world would soon fall apart. And, or as the way they like to put it, one world or none, which again, this very stark set of choices. And the most influential of these scientists who sort of advocated on these in the sense that he was closest to power itself was uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. He is the so-called quote unquote, father of the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer in the post-war would leverage his fame and connections to push for international control and develop practical policy. He was on the committee that developed what's known as the atchison lilienthal Report in early 1946, which tried to make these sort of vague ideas of people like Bohr or even just the fears of people like Bush and Conan into a very strict international framework. How would you go about doing it? And in short, it would involve the United Nations taking over and uh, having an incredible ability to monitor whether countries were making the fuel for these bombs because those the, the, the facilities for making the fuel require these very large installations and are very hard to hide. And this eventually did get put into the United Nations. The very first official act of the United Nations was to establish a committee to actually look at these questions. And this plan became what's known as the Baruch Plan. A version of it was presented by the United States as a serious plan that the international community might sign on to. Now, it didn't succeed, both for reasons on the American side and on the Soviet side. The Americans were not willing to give up their existing atomic bomb stockpile until they had absolute assurances that Stalin wasn't building a nuclear weapon himself. And Stalin was building a nuclear weapon himself, but uh, the Soviets were unwilling to trust the United States on any of these points either. And the the whole thing fell apart uh, over a reasonably short period of time. By the time it fell apart, it was becoming clear to many that there was going to be no quick fix for these problems. And that's sort of where you see the end of these utopian ideas about either where, uh, how you're going to survive or how everything's going to be destroyed. By the end of the 1940s, you start sliding really into a sort of long-term Cold War mindset, which is you know, sort of the one we still live in today. The plans for domestic control of atomic energy, which is to say what kind of American organization would take over the Manhattan Project, uh, also zigzagged in this period. Uh, immediately after the war, legislation for to create a new Atomic Energy Commission uh, had been drafted by the War Department and introduced in the Congress. This had been developed by the interim committee with input from Bush and Conant, but most of it had been drafted by an army lawyer. Uh, the initial version of this law, the May Johnson Act, was pushed by the wartime scientists and even Truman as being necessary, if very harsh. And the, the language they would use is, if you don't pass this law quickly, we will have national suicide. Things will fall apart. And Truman's own way of uh, compelling Congress to pass this law was to invoke, again, this idea of this disjunction in history. The measures which I have suggested, this is from Truman, may seem drastic and far-reaching, but the discovery with which we are dealing involves forces of nature too dangerous to fit into any of our usual concepts. And this is, again, where this sense that 
humanity is going in this different direction and we need to start thinking about really radical ideas. In the end, the initial Atomic Energy Commission ideas were too radical. There was organized resistance by scientists, including many who had worked on the Manhattan Project and did not want the army running things anymore. And there were several sympathetic congressmen who uh, helped basically scuttle the bill. This led to a long series of slow hearings that led to a new law uh, this was initially the, called the McMahon Act, and it was a, the, the next law was going to be written almost entirely with scientists in mind. It had very little restrictions on research, very little restrictions on secrecy, things like that. But there was a spy scandal in early 1946, probably leaked to the newspapers by people in the military, and it led to extensive rewriting of the law and the Atomic Energy Act as passed had extremely draconian security, some of which was unprecedented and is still unprecedented in the way in which security and secrecy works in the American system. And in the original versions of this, violations of this could be punished by death, which is you know about as extreme as you can get. The Atomic Energy Act that was finally signed into law was neither all good nor all bad. It was actually deliberately written to contain contradictions. So it would tell this new commission that was being created that on the one hand, they had to further all these peaceful aims. On the other hand, they couldn't let any secrets out. And if they did, then everybody would be punished. And the idea behind this by the legislators was that if you write in these kind of contradictory extremes into law, people will be able to choose between them to find the best policy. In practice, it doesn't ever work that way. And you can tell this was written by some junior legislators. It actually means that you go with the thing that has the most punishments, which is to say a very conservative reading of the law. And we still have this law in effect. It's gone through some revision since then. This rhetoric of there being a new world, of, of going into this sort of new era, reoccurs in curious places around the history of the atomic bomb, both as a sort of general metaphor, but also sometimes in, in direct reference to the Columbian exchange, this idea that we've actually discovered this new territory and it's going to change everything about the world. It's an interesting way to see the terms in which these people thought, the metaphors and analogies that they had available uh, to them. For some time, as we've seen, there have been references in their speech to these various revolutions of old, the Copernican, the Newtonian, the Columbian. For others, uh, the inspiration was not from looking to the past, but looking into sort of imagined futures, which are again, sort of extrapolations of the present. H.G. Wells in particular is a very influential writer, both directly and indirectly on many of this thought. H.G. Wells imagined not only atomic bombs long before they were actually built, but he also imagined that with bombers that could strike anywhere at all time, you could have this kind of uh, almost dictatorial bomber corps that would sort of poli a world police that would hold everything together and keep everything from falling apart. And you can see those strains in some of these thinkings as well, that this is going to lead to a sort of new world government. And of course, they also had visions of destruction in mind, things they're trying to avoid. They were extrapolating the destruction of World War II, which was mostly individual cities, but applying that to all civilization itself. At the same time, they did try to inject some radically new ideas. I don't know of too many precedents to Bohr's idea of wandering scientists sort of saving everybody. And some of those ideas are so bizarre today that it's hard to really make, you know, take them very seriously. But I think that that's partially because they're not founded on much explicit uh, historical practice, and they also didn't get put into place. Obviously, if Bohr's ideas had been put into place, we wouldn't find them so strange. The only thing that pretty much everybody agreed on was that lack of action in a very specific, you know, co coordinated way only had one future path, uh, radioactive ruin. Their imagination of bad outcomes was curiously far more limited than their imagination of the good outcomes, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, in the end, we didn't get international control of nuclear weapons. We got the secret arms races that people like Bush and Conan and Bohr fear. We live in their, in some ways, worst case scenario world. We got weapons that were a thousand times more powerful than the ones used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they were produced by the tens of thousands. We got a 20th century where, at times, the, the United States' explosive capabilities were equivalent to well over a million of the Hiroshima bombs, where the United States and the Soviet Union would both acquire and maintain the capacity to eradicate hundreds of millions of lives over the course of several hours, and where peace was at times just a razor's edge from war, where many of the statesmen involved would chalk up civilizational survival to mere luck, which is a very scary thing to have people who were involved with, say, the Cuban Missile Crisis say. But the war itself, the big conflagration, it didn't come. 
we didn't have World War III in the sense that they imagined. Instead, we had a slower, more drawn out affair, a slow simmer, a Cold War of proxy battles, which still killed millions in the countries in which they were fought, but not hundreds of millions as the nuclear wars would. It was a Cold War of spies and official secrets and lies, uh, of a ter internal repressions by governments uh, in, in many countries. It's not the worst possible outcome, but it's far from the best. And historians and commentators frequently talked about the Cold War as something that was won or something that was kept the peace and other sort of positive spins on it, mostly because that big death didn't happen. I personally think that's a pretty low bar to hold humanity to, that it managed to avoid turning on the genocide machines that it had spent its resources and labor to create. And I say this with every awareness and sympathy of how close full war actually came at times and with the gratitude that it didn't. And also with a full awareness of exactly what logic it takes you to think that you need to build all of these things. None of these people were crazy by any means. This is a very rational endeavor that led us through this path. So what does this, this history teach us about our present moment as we grapple from one case of business as unusual after another? Perhaps it shows us the worst case scenarios that we might imagine are avoidable if we try. Perhaps it also tempers us from dreaming that the best case scenarios are likely to occur as well. But I would also caution against believing that it will be simply something in between those options of extreme terribleness or extreme goodness. Uh, there's other forms of goodness and other forms of badness, some of which are very hard to imagine in your present historical moment. I want to close with one last little thought on the value of history and, and what it teaches us. There's a quote by the uh, famous Dust Bowl photographer, uh, Dorothea Lange, that I've thought a lot about in recent years. Here's her quote. The camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. One more time. The camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. And if we apply the same sort of logic and phrasing, maybe history is an instrument that pe teaches people how to see themselves without reading about it in a book. We can see ourselves uh, as being participants in these grand shifts and cycles. Uh, the serious study of the past must be a way to think about the present. It must be. Historicism, the sort of worldview that historians have, that our present and futures are determined by, to some degree by what has come before, uh, and that understanding the past helps you see your world clearly and more accurately, uh, needs to be at the core of how we regard what we do today so that we can end up in some kind of perhaps better future. Or to move more in the direction of the Lang quote, we need to be able to see ourselves not as the present and not moving into the future, but as some future someone's past. Uh, we're not the future, we're a really long, long time ago to some other people, hopefully. Our business as unusual will not be limited to a particular disease, nor a set of wildfires, nor political trends in, in various countries, nor whatever short-term chaos the world is likely to throw at us in the next few months or years. 2020 is not over yet. We are people who find ourselves sometimes somewhere in the middle of a major historical shift, something on par probably with the Industrial Revolution, bigger than the Scientific Revolution, and there will be some winners and many losers. The deep study of history is about us recognizing that we are not the end point in the story. We are always firmly in the middle of it. You can't use history predict to predict the future, but you can use it to understand the now, and more importantly, to see that the now is just the future's past. It is a radically different view than we are used to dealing with. Anyway, thank you so much. That's my presentation. Thanks for sitting through it. I appreciate it. Well, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person in the audience with the spectacular urge to applaud. Um, unfortunately, the format doesn't let us do that. Um, so you just have to take my quiet little clap um, as being representative of the uh, very large number of people who just watched that. Um, we're going to move now to the Q&A portion of the, of the, of the keynote. Um, and if you have questions for um, Professor uh, Wellerstein, please um, send them through the Q&A channel. Um, we will pick them up um, and read out a selection uh, for his uh, delight and amusement. Um, as that happens, um, what um, I'm gonna do first is ask a question that's very dear to our hearts at Ask Historians, because it's very rare that a academic marries the practice of public digital history with scholarly, academically credible work. And what we're really interested in is the interplay between the two. How does your work as a kind of academic historian who works in archives, writes books and articles and so on, 
interplay with the work you do in public? Do they, do, how, how does the public history impact the way you write history for a more specialized audience? That's a really good question. Uh, there's a couple different ways. One is that occasionally I, I do get a question or I see a question that's asked over and over again uh, on a place like Ask Historians that turns out to be the kind of question that academics typically don't ask themselves, but that regular lay people, non-academics are, are apt to ask. Uh, academics frequently like to ask very big, you know, large scale questions where sometimes a very simple question like, um, uh, you know, did the uh, United States think about warning Japan about the atomic bomb? A very straightforward question that you can tug on it a little bit and actually get pretty interesting answers when you dive down into it. And so I've actually gotten some good inspiration and some, uh, uh, the, the process of sort of answering something on Ask Historians sometimes can lead me to looking into sources that I normally might not have looked into. And that can, over time, lead me to a lot of sorts of insights that are useful, not just for lay people, but even academics also find useful as well. The, the other area is that there is something about repeat engagement, and anybody who's been a teacher will identify this, but you learn your subject best when you're forced to sort of resynthesize it and repeat it to others. And this is the answer to the question that sometimes is asked on Ask Historians, how do historians remember so much? And the answer is that we teach this stuff all the time if you're in an academic context. And if you are teaching something that engages a different part of your brain than learning does, uh, it sort of cements things into your neurons one way or the other. And uh, so as a, as a sort of general practice, if you answer a lot of questions about a lot of things, you'll end up uh, uh, actually, I think, making your brain a little more pliable with a lot of different topics. So I have found it just a useful sort of thing. It flows back and forth, not just with my reaching, but, uh, researching, but also my teaching, uh, uh, this way of thinking about it. And it does change how I write. I mean, when you write an answer for an Ask Historians response, you're writing for a very general audience. And if you're doing it well, you try to be very descriptive and point out the things that maybe aren't obvious or, or, or maybe another academic, you could, you could sweep into a bunch of jargon or something like that. And uh, I found in general that writing plainly is a, is a benefit in almost every arena. Occasionally you have to bring out the jargon if you want to impress people in academia, but you know, that, that's actually the easier thing to do, so. Well, I, I, we were meaning to call you out on the lack of jargon in your, in your yes, talk right. there, and we, we find you considerably <laughs> less credible as a result. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would like to take the point to know that I thought the chat would not be enabled for the, uh, for the <laughs> presentation. Turns out it is, and everyone agreed with me that it was an excellent presentation, so I thought oh, I'd just relay great. that to you quickly. <laughs> Um, I have a question from uh, Josh Porter, um, who's asking about the kind of the post-war imagination happening before the war ends. And he's curious about how this plays into the decision to actually drop the bombs. So does this imagined world play into this decision-making process, presumably from Truman and, and others? Is, is that something that's in the back of their minds when they, when they take these very fateful decisions? It's a really great question. And I don't want to open up the whole can of worms that is like the decision to use the atomic bomb because it's it's a very deep, it, it's a complicated topic. And it, it, if you look on the frequently asked questions of the Ask Historians, you'll see I've answered it several times in great detail there. But the brief thing is for some people, yes, this is deliberately behind their thinking. And what's interesting is you have these people like sort of Stimson and Conant and Oppenheimer who are sort of, those are the ones who are actually coming up with the sort of bare bones of what the bomb is gonna be used for. Not Truman, Truman isn't really involved in that kind of conversation. And it's these other people like Stimson and the interim committee, they're the ones who eventually think dropping it on a city makes the most sense. And they're saying that in part because of these imaginations of the future. So. Someone like Oppenheimer, for example. Oppenheimer has no love of like mass slaughter. That's not the kind of person he is. Uh, but he is afraid that the next generation of bombs is going to be so terrible. The arms race that could come will be so terrible that if people don't appreciate the power of nuclear weapons, the world is going to be in a very dangerous state. So for somebody like that, making the first use of the bombs as horrible and explicit as possible by destroying cities that had not been bombed previously, right? By, by making it very clear the before and after of using one of these bombs, 
he was hoping that that would be what gets the world on a path to never using nuclear weapons again. And we didn't get international control like we, he wanted, and we didn't get everything else we want, he wanted, but we haven't had a nuclear weapon used in anger, you know, against another city or something since the Nagasaki attack. And so in that sense, he might have been right. It, we'll see, right? It's too, it's too early to say. But that's part of his justification. And that's a very different kind of justification than the like, and the war justification, which some people really did believe also, um, the this could be useful with regard to the Soviet Union, which some people did believe. There's a lot of different justifications depending on who you're looking for. What's the sort of end takeaway is that everybody who was really involved with these things thought there were good reasons for using the bombs. Uh, very few people uh, at the high levels objected or raised any questions about using them. Um, and so this was one of the reasons, though it's not the only reason. I think the, the habit of providing comprehensive answers on Ask Historians is clearly translating to the keynote um, as well. Um, I've got a question from Corey Bowen, who's interested in the mention you made of H.D. Wells and the influence that authors like H.D. Wells had on kind of visions of the future. And he's curious if there are any direct references to authors such as H.D. Wells in the writings of those who worked on the bomb. Um, or any other kind of speculative fiction? Do the people who are creating this thing have these kind of reference points in mind? Some of them definitely do, um, especially some of those early on. I mean, the most prominent is Leo Zillard. I showed you a little picture of him with Einstein early on, but didn't call him out. Zillard is one of the first people to sort of uh, think about nuclear weapons and to really push the American government to worry about them. And he explicitly uh, cited H.G. Wells. I mean, he said he understood the implications of nuclear weapons immediately, like right after the discovery of fission, because he read his H.G. Wells. And uh, he actually was thinking about some of these ideas even before the discovery of fission and was sort of primed so that the minute it the right scientific discovery came around, he was already thinking about all the directions this was going to go. Um, there's a few others who were clearly heavy readers of Wells. There were, are a few other uh, uh, discussions of use, in, invocations of fiction and speculative fiction. But of course, a lot of that stuff uh, was still so, somewhat in its infancy at these times. It wasn't as big of a, uh, a business as it is today, though there were places where there were overlaps. Um, so yeah, super great question. And beyond the direct references of Wells, Wells became a sort of framework for a lot of thinking about atomic energy even before nuclear fission when radioactivity was discovered and things like that. Wells himself, as an aside, um, explicitly credited another scientist, uh, uh, Frederick Soddy, who won the Nobel Prize with Rutherford for his work on transmutation. Soddy is a, was a scientist and a popularizer. And so he wrote a book in 1908, The Interpretation of Radium, which is all about sort of making sense of radioactivity and its social implications, which then Wells takes and turns into um, his book on the atomic bomb, and he explicitly credits Saudi for these things. So there's like a really nice interplay between scientists, science fiction, scientists, like everybody is sort of thinking in these circles. The other place where you see a lot of this sort of Wellsian influence is actually Winston Churchill, um, who corresponded with Wells personally and whose science advisor was sort of in that same vein. Um, and Churchill is very important for pushing the Americans into building a bomb project as well. So there are some people very at the top uh, who were thinking about these things, in part because they were inspired by speculative fiction, for sure. Thank you. Um, I'll just jump straight into another question. This one's from Angela. Um, he's asking about the extent to which scientists were involved in a lot of the early decision making about the creation of the bomb, maybe not at the policy level, perhaps at the policy level, but, you know, practical decisions. And is curious about the impact this might have had since on scientific ethics. Does the ethics of bomb creation then get discussed and reflected in later practice? So the trend you see in the 1930s is that the scientists are the ones initially pushing all of this. And then as the ball gets rolling, basically the government in various forms, sometimes of other scientists, somebody like Vannevar Bush, who's a scientist but working for the government, starts to sort of take away autonomy and starts to say, you're not really, you shouldn't be in, in charge of this. We, we let, let the professionals deal with this. And then eventually the military sort of takes away the autonomy from them as well. And the scientists who worked on the project, many of them uh, 
felt that they had basically started something that then they couldn't control anymore and they resented it. And this is why in the post-war, many of them made their resentments extremely loudly heard in what's called the scientist movement. Um, there are a few exceptions of scientists who actually did have a lot of power, Oppenheimer being the sort of one who had the most uh, of, of probably all of them. Oppenheimer himself sort of believed that scientists needed to have a special responsibility. And this became a real theme in talking about scientific ethics in the post-war onward. Um, this idea that because, um, as Oppenheimer put it, the physicists had known sin, right? That, and that was a knowledge they could never get rid of, that they now had this obligation, this moral obligation to make sure their inventions were used for the right direction. I think it's really interesting that up until through the 1960s and maybe even the 1980s, this was still a pretty active part of a lot of uh, physics discussions. There was a lot of, you know, uh, discussions of, of uh, engineering ethics and science ethics that wasn't just about like, don't steal from your company, which is what a lot of engineering ethics is today from what I can, uh, have seen of it. Um, and um, a lot of that seems to have dropped away at the end of the Cold War. My students frequently, uh, we talk about this, I teach at an engineering school, and we do talk about these things, but they don't regard themselves as having a special responsibility anymore. And I don't know if that's my students or that's in general, but the shifting of STEM education, I think has gone so far in the direction of STEM equals careers that it isn't about like STEM opens up new powers in the universe the way it sort of was during the Cold War. And in a way that's, that's sort of reduced the ethical uh, uh, interactions that used to be there. Thank you. Um, what I want to do now is just uh, do a kind of combination of two anonymous questions that we've received. Um, the first one is very open-ended, um, but I'd like to sort of narrow it down a bit more with the other question, um, which is, are there any important figures in kind of this, the saga of the atomic bomb that you, should, you think should be more well-known or more frequently discussed? And the way I want to narrow that very broad question is we also had a couple of um, questions about the issue of kind of gender. And it's, it is noteworthy that all the figures you're talking about are white males of a certain age. And I'm, I'm just going to go out and live and guess of a certain kind of uh, background. How does the picture look if we kind of expand that a bit? Like how are different types of people imagining the, this conversation? Um, women, other races, other countries? The, the difficulty, of course, the, the systems of power that erected all of the secrecy and controlled who, uh, uh, who was part of these conversations uh, were, were by the standards of today and arguably by the standards of then pretty racist, pretty sexist systems, right? So you don't get a lot of voices that are allowed at that table. The table of people talking about this at the official level was relatively small during the Manhattan Project. Um, that doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of women working on it, and some of them, I'm sure, did have uh, sort of long-term thoughts, but this leads to a historical narrative that's far pushed in that direction. There were also a lot of people of color working on it, though they were usually relegated to roles in which they didn't know what they were building. So uh, most of the people working on the Manhattan Project, of course, did not know what they were building until after Hiroshima. Um, in the post-war, though, you get a lot more diversity of discussion, and um, one of the really separate from figures, there are some interesting figures, but, but they're sort of, I, I like to focus instead of sort of interesting discourses, which are in some ways not dependent on whether somebody was well placed or not. There's really interesting work that's been done um, by uh, Vince Ayatondi on African American views of the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. And I've found it really useful. Um, I've at various times had access to ProQuest's um, they have an excellent searchable database of African-American newspapers from the 20th century. And it's really quite interesting to see what kinds of topics they pick that say like the New York Times won't cover or something like that, or the spin that they wanna uh, look into it. And it's a pretty complicated thing because uh, there were a large number, especially at Oak Ridge in Tennessee, there were a large number of African-Americans who worked on the bomb. And so these papers are half like, we made this too. <laughs> But then they're also sometimes having like, was this a good idea kinds of discussions. They're more willing in some ways uh, to question the sort of official narratives and sometimes to privilege the voices that the official narrative try to squelch. So for example, there was a white scientist guy um, who after the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima, he was actually connected in very minor way to the Manhattan Project. He wrote a news article saying that based on his understanding of the science, um, Hiroshima was gonna be uninhabitable for 70 years because of the radiation. And the, uh, the powers that be did not like the story. It wasn't true, but 
uh, uh, but that wasn't, they didn't know if it was true at the time, but because it wasn't, they rejected it sort of out of hand anyway. And they had a huge campaign to basically shut it down. And very few pa- newspapers, from what I could tell, actually ran the original story, though some of those were these African-American newspapers, whereas almost everybody ran the rebuttal. And so that's the sort of asymmetries that you can sort of see in these things. There is a lot to be said on issues of race and gender in the Manhattan Project and in nuclear weapons, um, more than I can probably say in a comment. Uh, but if you're interested uh, for gender stuff, Carol Cohn's work is sort of essential and is about sort of the, 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 the sort of maleness of the defense intellectual stance and the sort of control uh, uh, fantasies that are at the sort of root of a lot of nuclear uh, systems and uh, on race, there's a whole lot that can be said, but uh, there's a volume that came out earlier this uh, year called The Age of Hiroshima. And I have an article in there, but there's a really great article in there by a, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Sean Malloy, which is about uh, sort of applying a real understanding of questions of race to things like the bombing of Hiroshima, not just asking the question, would they have bombed it on the Germans? And if they would have, then it doesn't mean that they were racist, right? But but to like actually look at the places in which it influenced what kind of policy they were putting forward, their sort of modeling of what the Japanese were like, um, and also uh, their, their sort of willingness to, you know, conduct mass slaughter on that kind of scale and things like that. Not just the atomic bombings, but even the fire bombings, which were much more extensive in Japan than they were in Germany. I think we have time for just about one more question before Zoom will inevitably kick us off. Um, and I think, I think we'll go, I, th- I think what, what is quite a nice uh, thematic follow-up to that um, is from Jake Hatton, who's asking about scientists from occupying uh, nations such as Poland and Czechoslovakia, and how, how are their visions of the future different um, than other scientists working on this project? Did they have a, a particular perspective about what atomic weapons meant um, for their own particular situation? There's a really interesting theme in a lot of this where, especially early on, some of the really key players, I mentioned Zillard already, but you can even include Einstein in this. Um, They're from, they're basically refugees from Nazism. And they are the people who push early on for the possibility of nuclear weapons far harder than um, sort of native born British or native born American or anything like that. And it's pretty clearly because they felt they had the most to lose. They had seen Nazism firsthand. They had seen uh, German science firsthand. They did not feel there was any margin of error allowable for whether or not Germany could make nuclear weapons. And thus, the United States had to go first and do this. Now, of course, it turned out Germany wasn't really making nuclear weapons. It's a whole other subject. But they didn't feel they had the luxury of making that kind of assumption. In terms of whether or not their visions of the future were optimistic or pessimistic, I'm not sure that it, it easily falls out into a sort of simple categories. Let me just give you two, two examples who I find, uh, uh, you know, very colorful, interesting figures. So Leo Zillard, I mentioned, H.G. Wells reader, pushes the early bomb project. He also had all sorts of ideas for the future. He worried about apocalyptic uh, outcomes uh, for sure. And at the end of the Manhattan Project, he basically never worked on nuclear weapons again, though he sometimes invoked ideas and, and sort of imaginative ideas about what nuclear weapons could be as a way of um, sort of thinking through the underlying issues and illustrating the people. So he wrote about the so-called cobalt bomb, which would be a bomb specially made to make human beings go extinct. He didn't want you to actually build this weapon. For him, this is like a metaphor for what nuclear weapons are going to be, right? These technical devices that could kill everybody. Contrast him with his friend from also, and and Szilard was a Hungarian uh, uh, refugee. Uh, Contrast it with Edward Teller, another Hungarian refugee, part of the same sort of circle. Teller also is thinking about the long term. He's also thinking about, you know, the, the, the big consequences. And he ultimately believes that the bombs have to be used Zillard opposed this, by the way, but Teller believes the bombs have to be used. And then Teller enthusiastically pushes to build giant bombs, hydrogen bombs. He's basically the, the quote unquote father of the hydrogen bomb. And in, at one instance in the 1950s, pushed to build a bomb that would be 10,000 megatons in explosive power, which is to say a bomb that by his own calculations would render a large percentage of the earth probably radioactive. And uh, I find these contrasts really interesting. And Teller worked in the military industrial complex his whole life. I mean, well into the 2000s. And 
I find them really interesting and someday I would probably like to write a book about both of them because at their heart, they're both looking for the same thing. They're looking for security. They both feel that they're in an uncertain, scary world. But Zillard's answer is basically world government and Teller's answer is have bigger bombs than the other guy. And interestingly, they both fantasize about really big bombs, but for totally different reasons. Teller actually wants to build his big bomb because he thinks that if you build it, nobody will mess with you. Whereas Zillard thinks that the idea of a big bomb will illustrate how crazy the whole thing is. And I just like them as they're sort of like two sides of the same coin. They're both engaging in very similar kinds of fantasies, but to very different ends. That is just about, I think, all we'll have time for in terms of um, audience questions. Apologies to the many people who asked very good questions and didn't get them addressed. Um, There's a forum on Reddit where you can ask really good history questions and people might answer them. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember the name of it though. Yeah, I mean, we, sh we should definitely find out about this. Um, if nothing else, let's see copyright infringement. Um, one thing I did, uh, to, uh, before we do um, close off, I do want to give you the chance to um, perhaps leave us with any closing remarks you had as well as uh, you did suggest some uh, very good literature there on gender and nuclear weapons, but if there's any other text that you would recommend to anyone looking to get into this further? Uh, two books I'll recommend just for anybody. One is if you're really interested in the scientist movement and the legislation questions, uh, uh, a Peril and a Hope by Alice Kimball Smith is a really great history of the attempts, and, and even the science ethics questions, but it's the attempts by physicists in the wake of World War II to sort of make a big uh, influence policy-wise. And it covers a lot of what I've talked about with Bush and Conan and Oppenheimer and stuff like that. Very well-written book and, and very nice. And the other is my favorite book on uh, the history of nuclear weapons, which is also totally relevant to this talk and is uh, extremely well written. Uh, Spencer Weert, Nuclear Fear, A History of Images. Um, it's basically um, a history of public reactions to nuclear threats and nuclear promises that goes all the way up. Uh, in the initial version, it goes all the way up through the 80s, and he has a revised edition that comes all the way up to the present. And so if you're interested in nuclear technology and its history at all, reactors and weapons and their complicated interconnections, uh, heavily recommend the Weert book. It's also beautifully written. I mean, nuclear fears is a fantastic segue for our next conference panel, actually, which is talking about the imaginations of the apocalypse. Um, I believe we have several papers there which will be looking at nuclear weapons and the various ways in which they've been imagined um, and feared. Once again, I'd like everyone to, to join me in thanking um, Professor Wellerstein. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic um, keynote, a very good way to, to frame the beginning of the conference and speaking to a lot of themes, which I think we're going to go, go back and pick over over the next few days. Um, please um, do stick around. Um, we've got our apocalyptic panel uh, coming up next. We have two more days um, full of content and I very much hope that uh, everyone will enjoy all of that as much as we've all enjoyed this keynote. So thank you once again, Professor Wellerstein. Thank you. It's been a real honor.